Hello, I'm Plinio Morita. I'm an associate professor in the School of Public Health Sciences at the University of Waterloo. And it is a great pleasure to be here presenting a little bit about our work in big data and public health. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not able to present uh, at, in Ottawa today because I'm in, actually in Rome presenting at the World Congress of Public Health. And, uh, but it's a great pleasure to be sharing some of our results and some of the, some of the lessons learned over the years on our projects at the University of Waterloo. So I will be discussing today how big data has changed the public health landscape and how we need to be better prepared as a profession uh, to use big data and to develop systems that are capable of leveraging the, the power of big data. I'm an, as I mentioned, I'm an associate professor in the School of Public Health Sciences, but I also hold some appointments at other organizations. I also, I also have a status only at the University of Toronto, as well as, um, as a research, a research scientist position at UHN in Toronto. At the University of Waterloo, I'm the director of the Ubiquitous Health Technology Lab, which is a multidisciplinary and multicultural team of researchers focusing on leveraging big data for different applications in public health. We have data scientists, computer, so, so, computer engineers, and software engineers, as well as health scientists, all working together to build data systems that can help us better understand our public health challenges in the world. My research it lies on the intersection of public health surveillance and IoT and mobile health. And I want to make clear here that I am not a public health surveillance researcher. I develop technologies that can, in the future, be used for public health surveillance. A lot of the work that we do is on the development of the data ecosystems and the integration of novel technologies in public health practice. And what has driven our research is the different, different extremes events that we have been facing around the world. So for example, we have been dealing with heat waves in Canada and, and globally. In countries like Mongolia, we've been working on the challenge of extreme air pollution. And more recently, of course, we had to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. And what all of those challenges have shown us is that public health surveillance is not prepared to deal in these extreme events. One of the main reasons is that oftentimes when we have, for example, lockdowns caused by the, the public health policies that are implemented, our public health officials and our clinicians are not able to reach patients, right? So the one way of accessing them is through remote technologies, either through the use of wearables or Internet of Things, like those are sensors that are usually installed in the home and can be used for, for, uh, for remote monitoring. So what has the COVID-19 pandemic shown us and what have we learned from, from the pandemic? The first thing was that, of course, we all know we were not prepared to deal with it. Our data systems were not robust enough. Simple things like evaluating the effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines were not possible in countries like Canada. We could only, only countries like Israel were able to effectively do it at a country level because they had like a more robust data system. But ultimately, again, back to that we, we were not prepared. If you look back at Larry Brilliant's presentation about 20 years ago, he talked about all the necessary components that our data systems would need to have for us to be able to properly respond to the pandemic. But unfortunately, we not only we were not prepared, but we are still not prepared for future extreme events. Everything that happened in the COVID-19 pandemic and my experience being here at the World Congress of Public Health, it's very clear that there is a very little knowledge transfer from what we're dealing today with for with future crisis. Like there's nobody talking about how we can leverage our lessons learned uh, lessons learned on future climate changes, climate change crisis that we're going to have to deal with. And but one thing that was really beneficial and a big change that we, we saw caused by and driven by the pandemic was the evolution of our digital health technologies and the, the health data systems around the world. They did become more robust, and we are now 
we that we have better systems to extract and manage data from all the different sources. So as a research lab and as a research team, how are we tackling these issues, right? And what are we doing to help improve this public health surveillance challenge that I just mentioned? So one example, we have been developing novel ways of extracting and monitoring populations. So we've been looking at next-gen public health surveillance tools using IoT devices. And those are wearables and sensors that can be connected to the internet through either through a phone or through a gateway. We have also been developing pipelines for collecting the data, managing it and presenting it to public health officials, as well as data repositories for hosting all of this wealth of knowledge that we, we collect from sensors. So let me give you a few examples of different big data initiatives that have been driven by the pandemic and that are making a difference that, and that we hope that in the future will become more prevalent in public health applications. So I would like to start with talking about corporate initiatives. So Fitbit, for example, had an amazing initiative at the beginning of the, the pandemic. So in April, of, April 2nd of 2020, they released a report on their website where they were talking about the changes in sleep pattern across the world driven by the pandemic. And one of the things that they observed was that the younger population was spending more time in bed compared to the older population. And one of the hypotheses that I have for, for this difference is that usually the 65 plus are the ones that have already gone through previous pandemics and extreme events in the past. So they knew, they, 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 they knew how bad things could, could become while the younger population was just waiting for the two or three weeks of lockdown that we were expecting at the beginning of the pandemic. And also, they also were able to showcase different sleep patterns across cities, mainly capitals around Europe. And well, yeah, if you look at all the, these are all European, European capitals. And the interesting thing is that they were able to do this within two or three weeks. And the reason for that, they have the data. They are the data custodians, they are the data owners. We need, to, as a public health profession, we need to learn to work with these organizations so that we can better leverage this intelligence. So in order to advance the field and explore it and to better, uh, to, to use smart homes for monitoring uh, healthy behaviors, we have been developing an ecosystem with a partner called Ecobee. I don't know if you have an Ecobee thermostat at home, but Ecobee is a smart thermostat manufacturer. It happens to be Canadian. It's a great partner, it's been working with them for over three, four years now. And we developed algorithms that allow us to use their smart thermostats and the sensors that are integrated into their system to monitor in-house behaviors. So we developed algorithms for sleep monitoring and indoor physical activity. And we have access to over 200,000 thermostats in North America. The greater majority of them are in the US. I think we have like 30,000 in Canada and 170,000 roughly in the US. But the power of this data, data that is already collected and easy to access is unbelievable. So we were able to, we published several articles on the use of this data for sleep monitoring. And the, the benefit of this data is that this is already pre-consented data. So Ecobee has a internal program called Donate Your Data, where they ask, there is Ecobee smart thermostat users if they would be willing to share their data with researchers for different applications. And our team specifically looks at health applications, looking specifically at sleep monitoring and indoor physical activity. And what are some of the public concerns that we have observed over the years after using, after working with these thermostats for so many years? People are usually concerned about the data hosting and who has access to their data. The fact that they all are always asking me, is my data really anonymous? Can my data be be de-identified. So ultimately, all of these concerns are related to the understanding of how this data is prepared and what has been done to protect their privacy. Using the same data, for example, we can see here a shift over time in wake-up time. So during 
the pandemic, like in 2020, we can see that this household started waking up a little bit later as we progress through the years, right? Like this is actually reversed. So at the bottom of the chart, we have midnight. And at the at top of the chart, we have 11, 55, 59 p.m., right? So it's, a, it's upside down. And that's why we see this upward curve. And we could also see differences in density in indoor mobility caused by the lockdowns. So this is a clear evidence that yes, the lockdowns worked, the, the households the data that we got show that people stayed at home more, uh, more frequent after the pandemic and after the lockdowns were instituted. So now let's take a turn into social media. The same data pipelines, the same ecosystems that we developed for accessing IoT data and managing IoT data are now being used for mining social media data and understanding different areas of public health. So we have been, for example, uh, using uh, Twitter data for, um, for looking at misinformation in the industry, for looking at public perceptions of heat waves, looking at exp the, the spread of propaganda uh, in the Russian war, and the public perception of around the COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy. And what this data is, we're able to mine data directly from Twitter using Twitter's APIs. And Twitter has a specific program that allow research, allows researchers to access the, da the data remotely. And this is a non-consented data, of course, because this is public data. Once you push, pu pu post something on Twitter, it's public domain and anybody can access it. It is identifiable. We know exactly which account posted it. And it's non-private, it's a public data set once people publish it. And we'll, it will be interesting to compare to the public concerns once we get there. And everything again is managed and hosted by Twitter, by the data custodian, by the organization that generated the data. So again, the importance of working closely with these organizations. So some of the public concerns around the use of social media and Twitter data. They are always concerned about the use of their quote unquote private data that they think it's private because people don't understand that when they post it on Twitter, it becomes public domain. So again, education and literacy is very important and that's what's lacking at this point. Here's a, a chart that shows the different Tweets, tweets over time, so looking specifically at dentistry, the misinformation in dentistry. And you can see that there are different times of the year where uh, certain posts are more prevalent than others. And we did saw, see a change in the, the, the posting patterns and that was caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. So a clear shift caused by the pandemic. The Third application that I want to talk about that we are working with, and this is something that I worked with in India, and he will be talking more about this. I'm just going to quickly go through it just to talk about the data challenges, was the use of Google mobility data for monitoring the effects of COVID-19 policies. So we, a group of researchers from Waterloo use data from Google mobility. Google mobility is a database hosted by Google that hosts information about mobility levels in different cities and in different areas of the city. So uh, residential areas versus uh, workspaces versus schools versus public transit, for example. And all of this data is extracted from the public use of Google Maps. So whenever you do a search on Google, Map, Google Maps and you search for a certain route and you confirm and you take that route, Google Maps always logs that information. Google, Ma Google owns your data. They have your entire historical search on, on their databases. They know where you have been over the past like n years that you have been using Google Maps. I am a big fan. I use Google Maps all the time, but I'm aware that they do have access to my data, right? And we use this data. They, Google used this data to generate mobility reports for different cities. And I'm gonna show you this briefly here, but this is actually Apple Mobility. This is not actually from, from the Google Mobility page. It's a different report, but it gives you an idea of what this data looks like. So you have, for example, this shift, this big drop in mobility levels around, this, around Montreal during March, 2020, driven by the pandemic with a 
like going back to normal levels as the pandemic progressed. Again, let's look at some of the public concerns. People were concerned that their location information will be leaked. They are concerned about their loss of privacy. They're concerned about their individual behaviors and their uh, traveling patterns being shared with the public. But again, it's important for them to understand that there, that Google only releases these aggregate reports. There is never individual data being shared with researchers. It's only this aggregate report that we get from, from Google. So in summary, what are, now that we've talked about all the different applications of big data in public health, or at least the applications that we have worked in the past, we're going to talk briefly about some of the greatest data challenges in public health and, pra and practice. So when we're dealing with big data, what are some of the challenges that we need to be aware of? And first, I think it's important for us to make a quick definition of what big data is. Right? And big data is often defined by the four Vs, volume, velocity, variety, and veracity. There are other definitions. Sometimes people talk about seven Vs, nine Vs. Different researchers have different definitions, but I think four Vs is enough for us to have a good conversation about what's needed here. So the reality is that public health agencies and professionals are not yet equipped to work with this data. And when I say equipped is because oftentimes the volume of data generated, the velocity in which this data is generated is so high that it's not feasible for us to use everyday uh, computer stations for working with this data. A lot of our work requires clusters of machines, cloud computing, massive ecosystems for data processing that are not usually available for the public health practitioners. So, so in, consequently, what happens is that a lot of data is being collected by these organizations, but there is no mechanism for public health officials to use. And the consequence is that a lot of this data, unfortunately, goes unused. And we need to start uh, investing more in developing these data ecosystems, the algorithms and the technologies necessary for using this data and implementing this in public health practice. And consequently, we need to train our professionals on how to use this data. We need to update our training, uh, our training materials in our universities and our master's programs around Canada to equip public health professionals with the necessary tools to work with this data. Another aspect that is important to comment here as well is the lack of consistent uh, data structures and repositories. Because the data is so varied and different organizations store their data in different data formats using different data, data models and <clears throat> often hidden behind corporate walls, it's often very challenging to access the data from these resources. Some data, some data systems are in the cloud, others use CSV files for data extraction. So it's important to create a translation layer in the middle that enables public health officials to easily access the data. It's very, very important for us to work on creating data repositories that can be easily accessible by public health practitioners so that they can use this data in their practice. And this is a big topic right now here at the World Congress of Public Health. There are a number of countries working on these data lakes and data repositories for public health. And I think we, as a, as a country, Canada also needs to invest more in this area. So what do we need? Sorry, I'm just gonna go back one slide. What do we need to advance the use of big data in public health. And I have four messages, four lessons that I want us to take away from this conversation today. So the first one is we need better literacy. We need to, we need better knowledge of dissemination. We need to educate our public. The, we, we need to tell people that this, the use of this data is safe. It's no different than other public health uh, tools that we use. And that this, this data is, a, a lot of this data is already public. When we're talking about, Fit, about sorry, Twitter data. When we're talking about Fitbit and Google data, whenever people are concerned about how their data is stored and they're concerned about the use of, for example, cloud computing, 
when we look at how Google and Fitbit are storing your own Google and your own Fitbit data, they're also using cloud ecosystems, the same ones that researchers use, like Microsoft Azure, Amazon AWS, the same ones are being used by the companies that are already hosting your data. The second thing is we need to train our, uh, sorry, no, my apologies. As a country, we need a centralized big data strategy. And it's important now that we're talking about the Canadian health data strategy, we need to start like also thinking and incorporating on this, these plans how to deal with these massive data sets because they are different. They require different computational uh, uh, power and different protocols should be stored and processed. Then the third thing is that we need to train our public health officials and our pub public health professionals on how to use this data and our uh, big, sorry, to, to use big data. And our uh, training programs in Canada need to be updated and we need to revamp our education to ensure that they leave our universities and they leave our master's programs around, around Canada with the necessary skills to work with big data. And the last thing is we need to start working on corporate public health partnerships, like the ones that I talked we are like co collaborating with Fitbit, for example, to create data systems that allow us researchers to peek into this wealth of data that Fitbit holds, right? We don't need individualized information. I don't need to know what John is doing today. But what I need to know is what hap what's happening with, the can with Canada as a whole during the pandemic. Imagine the power of having access to, these, to, to this data at your fingertips. And it's doable, it's easy. Fitbit does it, they have, they have the dashboards in real time, internal to their organ organization. We just need to create mechanisms for our public health officials to work with them and access this data. So these are the four takeaway messages. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate having this conversation with you and I'll be here for any questions.